So to start this journey off, we're gonna go to the Amazon and we're gonna look at the Terra Preta. And this is because Terra Preta is one of those sustainable techniques where we look at sustainable farming and we look at a culture where there's a lot of rain and there's a lot of pressure and a lot of decomposition. And my own thinking about the rainforest was, yeah, man, there's food everywhere and it's easy to grow food. But the reality was the rainforest because there's so much growth and so many things happening in the rainforest, the decomposition gets pushed right back into new growth. Very little stuff sits around. So the soils are very poor in the rainforest, but there's a tribe of people in the Amazon that were able to live on the banks of the river very sustainably, and they were able to take all of their waste materials and all of the carbon and charcoal from their fires and combine them together and lay them out into a waste system, into these pits that produced all the food for these cultures. Now, when the first settlers had come through the Amazon and they saw these, these uh, indigenous cultures, they would write the archives about them and there was hundreds of thousands of people in some of these settlements. So the settlers, when they came through, brought these, the information back to the queen and told her, hey, there's a lot of people here. And they talk about, there's a city of gold. They refer to it as El Dorado. And they, they told the queen that El Dorado was up the river, but they needed more cash to keep going. So when the queen sent them back up the river to find the El Dorado, the natives were gone and they fled. And so the archives then started to talk about a native technique, which we know a lot about, the slash and burn method, and in this method, but when you look at the methodology of slash and burn, this is a farming practice that was done by a group of people that were on the run. They knew that they were in danger, and they still had to grow food. So the slash and burn kind of got adapted as the methodology, but being if the natives were able to stay home and they weren't endangered by the new arrivals, they would have referred to the terra preta method. The terra preta is the method that is for long-term housing. If you plan on staying on your land a long time, this is how you, we adapt these methods. And the way I look at it, and I always say this is, when my computer doesn't work anymore, I have to reset it back to a date where it operates correctly. And I think sustainable agriculture is kind of in that position where we're looking back at different models from all around the world and looking at well, what worked correctly and we're bringing them back into the limelight and into the education light. So this here, Terra Preta, is, is a technology that I know we can use again because the carbon is really the basis of many, many biological processes that allow for that complexity. So I'm gonna show you today a method that we call the conservation burn method. And this is a method that we approve if you're currently doing a, a, a burn, an, an ag style burn method. But this is a very crude way to make biochar. And I'll talk to you more about the different qualities, but if you're burning your ag waste already, I think that if we adapted the conservation method, we could remove a lot of the particulates in the air from the smoke burns and also maybe trap some of that carbon and sequester the CO2 into the soil. So I advise you guys to look around for some of the kiln technology that they have out. Um, Kelpie Wilson's one of my favorite uh, kiln makers, but you'll be able to see smaller technologies you may be able to bring onto the farm that can take some of that um, load waste off and get it redirected back and, and close the loop on that. So what we do at Sonoma Biochar Initiative, we teach a method called the conservation burn. And simply put, we, we get our, our stack of wood. And if I had my my um, moisture meter, I would zap my wood and if the wood was about a 25% um, moisture to about a 15% moisture, that would be ideal for this type of burn. Any too much moisture, you'll get too much smoke. So we try to keep this to between a 15 and 25% moisture content within the wood to get a nice burn. But what we're gonna do different here is traditionally when we light our fires, we light these fires down at the bottom. And what happens is as the fires begin to burn, the gases begin to get released from the biomass matter, but it's not hot enough, so we associate that with a lot of smoke. And that's what we don't want here. The smoke is what's contaminating a lot of the areas in, ag, in the ag field. But what we're gonna do here is we're gonna light our fires now up at the top. And what this is gonna do, it's gonna allow for that flame front as it starts to heat the biomass down below, it's going to release the, the, the volatile gases into that flame front, growing the flame front bigger. So then we should be, as the flame front grows, it should, if this is done right, trap a lot of the smoke and get combusted within the flame front, reducing it to about 98% of the particulates that's associated with these types of burns. So, um, if we were to have a big pile, you would put your smaller sticks down at the bottom, maybe some of your bigger pieces in the middle with the bird's nest kind of setting up at the top. 
and that should get your fire going pretty good. You may need to use an alcohol accelerant to get that going. We try to stay away from hydrocarbons for any type of accelerant because it's gonna go back into the garden. So I'm gonna light my fire at the top and as that fire starts to grow, it's gonna release the gases from the biomass and as the gases get released from the biomass, we hope that just carbon is left behind. And I kind of like to picture this process like wringing a sponge out. The heat is like the, the pressure being applied to the wood matter. And as the more heat gets applied to that wood matter, the more volatiles get released from that biomass. And it's gonna leave us behind if you put it under a microscope. This beautiful honeycomb structure, which allows fungi, bacteria, nematodes, all the things in the soil, it's their home. I mean, this, this, this new home of pure carbon, well, this is probably gonna give us a 50 to 60% carbon ratio, but the honeycomb structure is gonna hold water. It's gonna provide the water, just like your home provides water. It's gonna provide shelter, very hard carbon shelter, so that when these microorganisms, um, if conditions become unfavorable, they can ebb in and out of the coral. Uh, in and out of the of the biochar like a, like a coral reef would act in the ocean and and then the last part is which we're really becoming fascinated about is the electrical conductivity that begins to be emitted by the carbon the ec there's a lot of stuff besides growth structure that is being emitted from the um, the, the electrical capacity of the char that is going to fuel not only the growth but just the ecosystem itself there's a whole group of microorganisms now that strictly take on electrons and give off electrons that are part of the food web that we're starting to learn more about and that i feel like these are the missing links when we get to do these parts of it and then my favorite part is the carbon i mean this is our old cannabis hemp waste this plant it grew on this farm it knows the gardeners it knows the problems that we have it knows that all of our secrets are in this wood as it grows and just like the forest behind me this forest would have never grown without fire meaning that the fire as it carbonized these trees it left behind a semiconductor of information behind so that the new trees that grow can access those semiconductor um, capacities and information and use that to network with the fungals and bacteria and all of the things that live here it's like our cell phones to us when we need to find something now we go to our cell phones but the carbon in the soil in the forest does the same thing and the forest would never evolve to where they've been without the power of the fire so we're gonna utilize this fire, we're gonna take this waste, and then we're going to, what I like to think of as programming the nature. Because as I said, this has a lot of data in here, but we're, we're gonna also add to that data. So as the fire burns, we'll talk a little bit about that. I'm gonna start the fire at the top, let's hope it goes. This is PDX, so it's been raining a lot. Let's see what we got. There it is. Now when you got your fire, you're going to light, the wind's coming from this side, you want to go on the downwind side when you light the fire. Because that way the, the, the air can come in and begin to fuel that flame front. And you'll notice now we're starting to get the visual fire going and the smoke is being actually consumed by the heat being produced by that fire. Now the trick is to maintain that heat equilibrium so that it can begin to keep up with the smoke as we start to see begin to be dispersed down uh, on, the, on the corners here. All that smoke is being caught up into the fire. There's no, no contaminants coming out of this thing. And you, this is why we utilize the conservation burn on vineyards out where I'm from in Napa. They just got piles and piles of this stuff that they burn all the time. And the, the Napa Valley becomes um, covered with smoke. So by reteaching this method in the Napa Sonoma Valley, they're not burning their fires different, but they're trapping that carbon. They're trapping that carbon and throwing it back into the soil, which is making a more complex wine because that carbon ring is directly related. In cannabis, we call it the terpenes, and same with wine, but without that carbon ring, you're not gonna have these extensive flavors that really show and exhibit the unique profiles of those varietals that you're growing. So we're finding by maintaining the carbon ring that that electrical source goes right up into the plant. You maintain your carbon ring of your terpenes, which means your, your flavors are staying on longer. They're not gassing off. And when it comes down to making a unique product, you'll see that the terpene test is something that a lot of clubs aren't doing because the soil's not intact and those numbers will obviously be lower. But the farmers that are exercising these very carbon rich um, soils, utilizing these probiotic technologies, they're 
terpene values are obviously going higher, the chemistries are higher, it's a more holistic um, plant at that time, whether it be cannabis or echinacea. You're providing that plant to develop its chemistry in, in the way it intended by giving it these elements um, required for, for biology. So we got a nice snap in here. So it's like a pretty good fire going, um, considering the moisture we have. Very little smokes coming off of this. Uh, pretty slow burn. Uh, traditionally, when we do burns in agriculture, these things can burn for days at a time. But when you're doing the top burn, because the heat pressure force is so hard on, so hot on that biomass, you'll uh, discard your piles within hours instead of waiting days for those piles to, to consume themselves. Now, as this fire burns, we have the carbon um, um, staying behind, and this is the part in science where we're learning about carbon being in flux. And when carbon reaches a certain temperature, um, whether it be a silica rock, uh, I mean, Silicon Valley's been developed off of the silica components being able to hold information. So the carbon's ability to hold information and how we load it is kind of where we're at with this thing. So on the conservation burn, when we get to a certain point, we put the fire out. But scientifically, if you're working with a compost tea specific to your site, like sometimes we have a block in a vineyard that's just doing exceptionally well. And then we have another block that's just not doing good at all. I like to make teas from the healthier blocks or the healthier potters and plants. And I can make a compost tea specific so that when I cool my fire down and that carbon's in flux, it begins to record the structure of that carbon. Now, when I mentioned Terra Preta and Cornell University came upon Terra Preta because they were reading the archives of the new arrivals and realizing they said there was hundreds of thousands of people in this area by the river. How could there be? There's no way that they can live there. There's no way. So Cornell, they came and they looked and they, they realized deep in the soil was 10, 20 feet of this carbon in there and the soil was black. So the terra preta refers to as a black soil. Um, we look at this, this soil as being the basic part of, 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 of the sustainable ecosystem of the indigenous people. But what we have to look at is how can we program this? So while Japan came down and did all their recording, they realized there was something with the carbon and they took back the technology. And the Japanese, as we know today, are leaders in bioceramic technology. And bioceramic technology is one of those practices where you take silica, you fire it at 2000 degrees to erase the memory from that original carbon. And then they cool it down at that point with a microbial tea or a microbial consortia. But during the fermentation, all of the goodies and the byproducts, the ATPs are nothing, but this is a byproduct from fermentation. Those ATPs are full of fuel and energy that then get contributed back into the carbon structure when we cool our teas down. So if we're able to make our own tea specific to our sites and cool our char with those teas, it seems like we have a greater chance of success within our uh, soil systems because you're programming those carbons specifically for your growing site and you're using the um, microorganisms that build your good, your, your good side of the farm into this. And we know we lose them to heat. You know, we know there's gonna be that sacrifice of those initial microbes. And it's not that they're living, but the implant is there. All of the byproducts from that fermentation are there. And the fact is, as we pull the fire down, that initial group that does sacrifice themselves to be part of that um, flux carbon structure, uh, eventually that fire cools enough so that the next load of microbes coming in can move right into those houses and begin to pre-charge that carbon. When uh, we looked at Terra Preta and why those soils were so successful, we know that the ancients were taking the waste material and combining it with the charcoal and then taking it off to a site to finish decompos decomposition. And then that's what they would grow on top of those sites. So that's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna take this carbon and we're, and we're gonna trap the information from these beautiful cannabis plants that have contributed themselves to us. And we hope that that data can then be shared into, into the next generation of, uh, of plants. Kind of like we're doing here, sharing generational information to the next generation of educated, um, sustainable farmers. And we hope that these practices can continue to thrive and grow into your own unique way, into your own unique brews. And we can build our, our, our soil from carbon to the microbes to 
those macro scales that, that we look at in permaculture. Yeah, so we'll let this cook down for a second.